We're gonna um, we're gonna do the talk. I'll do the talking. Chris is gonna do the clicking, and we're gonna start by giving you a little bit of history about how we got to so much lawn, and then talk about some of the reasons why we might want to have less lawn, an ecological alternative. Um, then after that, um, we're gonna kind of go through those slides fairly quickly and we're going to tell you more about how to do it, how to get rid of your lawn, where to find plants for it, how to start your own, whatever, and also some websites that you can access to do some more research so you can learn about these things before you just go and buy them. So that's um, the research is something that most people don't want to do, but if you're converting to something like what we're going to be showing you, you have to understand what it is you're growing and not just picking something because there's a pretty flower on it. So let's get started. So how did we get here? Okay. So back in the 16th centuries all the way up to present uh, 20th century, European landscapes look like this on the Grand Estates. Lots of lawn, trees around the edges, but it was maintained by the staff. Homeowners didn't do anything there except pay for it or own it. Um, here in the United States, the same thing was happening in the 17th and 18th 19th and 17th, 18th and 19th century. This is George Washington's home and Jefferson's home, and it's the same deal. Lots of lawn maintained in both of these cases by slaves. Next. Things started changing around the late 1800s when someone invented the lawn mower, and in this image, the man in the middle with the bowler hat is actually a salesperson trying to sell the idea for the homeowners, which are standing in the back observing all of this in their finery, but they weren't doing the work. It was the workers, again, that were doing all of the work. Next. And all of this was eventually being sold to less wealthy people as setting the lawn as a status symbol. So not everyone was wealthy, but these little lawn mowers made it more possible for people to conceive of having lawn for themselves. And then in the 50s, after World War II and all the GIs started returning home, there were builders who were recognizing that we needed a lot of quick housing for all of these people. And they, there were subdivisions like this. This is probably the most famous one. It was from the 50s, um, built by uh, George Levitt in Levitt, Levitt Town, New York. And this became sort of the standard. We are still doing this now. We're still lever leveling farmers' fields and also lever leveling forests so we can achieve a lawn and a home for every um, home, homeowner. So that's kind of the idea of the American dream. If you can now have your own little plot of lawn and um, and all of that was made possible for all these young men returning from World War II with the advent of the GI Bill. It helped them get loans to either buy farm, farms and property or to buy Houses, so they could have their own space. During the sixties, is where it peaks. So in the mid fifties, right about here, you start seeing an amazing jump in the number of articles in popular gardening magazines about lawn care. Now, this, the highest one that you see on the very right hand side of your screen is again, a, again another bump up after or during COVID. But the focus now of those articles in popular magazines and newspapers 
is really not lawn care so much anymore. It's native plants, ecological gardening, ways to help cure the bad environment. So where did that all led us? Even with the advent of lawns, we have a lot of lawns that everyone wants a perfect lawn, so then you have irrigation. How many of you have irrigation systems like this for your lawn? All right. <laughs> The map here shows how many lawns there are in the country, and the total area of lawns in the country is about the size of the state of Georgia. And those of you who are watering are contributing to using um, 20 trillion gallons of water to keep your lawns looking good. The entire food industry in the country is using 30 million gallons, so you're almost, trillion gallons, so you're almost, you know, two-thirds of how much the agriculture industry is using. And a result of all of these lawns being built in, we're decimating the native vegetation almost at the half of the rate that we're destroying the Amazon rainforest, and that is a pretty startling statistic. Okay, so, lawns are contributing a lot to pollution. I think everyone is pretty aware of that. Um, first of all, lots of pesticides. I was just at Site One, the landscaping company where a lot of contractors go to buy their chemicals to put on the land. And I saw a graph, I should have saved it, of all the different chemical treatments that if you have a lawn service, what they are putting on. So there's pre-emergent, there's three different fertilizer schedules, there's um, an application for rising weeds, there's an application for um, fungus and diseases, and other applications for insects. And those that are applied to the lawns, whether you need them or not. And so that's contributing needlessly to a lot of pesticides in the environment, which are then washing off our lawns and getting into our water systems. The other statistic we found here was that a leaf blower, a gas powered leaf blower, when it's just idling, going from here to there uses as much, produces as much um, pollution as a pickup driving 235 miles. I don't know where you found that, but I don't believe right it. But it's pretty startling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, next one. So, so it's not just um, And a result of all of those chemicals and air pollution is that we've had a worldwide decline in, um, in insects. Worldwide, so not just here in the United States. But you see over 60% um, of the cassid flies, those are the, the things with those gossamer wings, like moths and stuff, butterflies, beetles, oops, sorry. oops. Um, so all of these things are Where's my clicker? Right there. Right where? Oh, oh sorry, the yeah. Batteries gonna fall out here. Okay. Um, almost fifty percent of all of these um, insects have declined as a result of all the pesticides and the air pollution. All right next. We've also noticed a strong decline in the number of birds, and that is essential that the birds are, that the reason they're declining is because their habitat has decreased. So we have a bluebird nest in front of our kitchen, and when the babies are being fed, when those bluebird babies are born, every 10 minutes, one or the other of the parents is feeding it. And what they're feeding it is typically larvae, caterpillars. And those caterpillars 
are more likely to be found on native trees, like our oaks, like our maples, like our cherries. They're not going to be found on crepe myrtles and whatever else is not from here. And yeah, that's what you were saying. There we go. So, how did we change? I mean, all of you have heard most of those facts, but none of that's really new. Um, so, we were noticing that a lot of articles are being written now about how we make some of these changes. And the photograph on the left is a lawn that we're feeding, we're fertilizing, and we're mowing once or twice a week sometimes. The photograph on the right um, shows a more ecological solution to all that lawn. And you'll notice that there's not only flowers, flower beds, but there are also trees and shrubs and a lot of um, ground cover. That's where we're trying to, we're wanting to be heading, supporting life rather than on life support. The increasing amount of water we're putting on, this is how deep the roots go on our fescue lawns. Three inches. That's not very deep. That's why you have to water all the time because that first three inches evaporates quickly. If you're using this drawing shows prairie grass root systems. Well, they're not all grasses. They're not all from the prairie, but that's the general broad category that we talk about them as. And those plants are all things that we can grow here as a substitute for that shallow rooted um, grass. Some of the, the oh, sorry, sorry. some of these go down to 14, 13, 14 feet. So imagine roots going 14 feet through our hard clay. They do it. And the other thing that they do is at the end of the year, a lot of those roots are dying off. It's, you know, it's just like parts of the plants die. And they stay in the soil and start contributing to organic matter in the soil to allow water to infiltrate even deeper into the landscape. So we're trying to support Pollinators. That's a lot of the reason why people want to convert some of their lawn because they want to support pollinators. And the way we do that is one, to provide food sources for them. And how come get all those pictures up there? <laughs> um, and all the insects, all of the pollinators have different mouth parts and sucking parts that need different types of flowers. So the more variety of flower shapes, tubular, um, rays like this, tiny little things like on the sluffiest, um, all of these contribute to attracting more good insects to your property. The other goal is that we want to support those insects all year round. So as early in the spring as you can, even some of your spring bulbs, which are not from around here, will have pollen and nectar to support those early emerging insects. So you've got some that come up in May here, and some in July, some in August, and some in way into October. If you can have a variety of plants in each one of those seasons, you're supporting a greater diversity of insects. One of the big problems with most gardeners is they see a bug and they freak out and they say, oh, we gotta get rid of that bug. Well, in reality, in, the, in nature, no one's out there spraying anything when there's an outbreak of insects. There's usually another insect 
waiting in the wings for that bad population to start elevating, and then these, what we call good bugs, yeah. beneficial insects, will rise to the occasion and start um, attacking those um, bad bugs. So here we have a draconid wasp, draconid wasp, and ladybugs. Cassie was just talking about, she saw a lot of ladybugs eating her, the aphids on her plant, and then she said, and then I saw all these little things here, and found out that those are the larva of the ladybugs. So the ladybugs don't do as much work as those little baby larvae, because they're trying to grow into adults, so they're eating a lot of those aphids. There are also um, insects, good, good, beneficial insects that attack their prey in many, in many different ways. So rather than reaching automatically for the pesticide sprayer, the, um, the role is that we kind of just step back and is the next slide with the except some damage for that? Go to the next no, one. No, I don't think so. Go to the next one. The next one. There. We, ex we accept a little bit of damage. So on the trees in the spring, when you see little nibbles taken out of those leaves, that's because the larva, which the birds are going to be feeding to their babies, are eating on that tree. The damage that you see is never really great enough that it's going to kill the plant. But it's part of that whole cycle of nature that everything supports everything else. All right, let's go back to that last slide. So one of, the, one of the goals that's just difficult for some of us gardeners um, is changing our perspective of what's beautiful. Um, now, lots of people love this kind of wild and woolly um, image. Chris, <laughs> Jan, <laughs> Mary, um, but in your front yard, this can often turn off a lot of your neighbors. So our thinking is that if you want to do this, start in the backyard, get comfortable with what you're doing, understand your plants, and then start introducing some um, native plants in the front yard. And we have some slides at the end of Kathy's garden, which definitely shows how to live in a really nice subdivision and still start introducing some native plants that provide all these beneficial ecological services. In the fall, our tendency is always to rake up all the leaves, to cut back all the plants and have it look really clean and tidy. But in reality, no one does that in nature, right? Um, inside a lot of these hollow stems, native bees are building nests that are where they would lay the eggs for their babies to grow. So if we cut all that stuff down right at the ground, we are reducing the habitat for those bees. Next, let's go two more slides. So providing habitat, not only need the flowers for the pollen and the nectar to support all those insects, but you also need to support some place for them to live. Just like human beings, we need food to eat and we need shelter to protect us from the elements. So providing habitat not only provides a place for them to overwinter, but also a place for them to lay eggs and rear their young. So if we're constantly keeping everything neat and tidy, we're removing a lot of those areas where um, it, good insects would normally be. And it's not just insects. We forgot to put that slide on of the, um, the turtles, that even other wildlife around the yard needs, need those plant materials to survive and over the winter. 
go back one. So right here, leave the leaves alone. This is a big push now by the landscape um, people to leave the leaves on your property. Forget the bagging them up and putting them on the street. You know, people in your neighborhood are doing that. Well, then you just go and take those bags and bring them to your property. <laughs> yeah. And most of us do that, right? Yeah. Um, and the leaves are one, instead of getting mulch from the mulch sellers, um, those will decompose as they do in the woods. And they will help provide habitat for all kinds of small um, amphibians, butterflies, um, bees, and my little turtles here, and all of these newts and salamanders, small rodents even. So your goal is to provide a habitat for all of nature, not just for you. And that's, that's kind of one of the slogans that we're using. Instead of gardening just for us, we're gardening for nature. So we've shown you a lot of pictures of flowers and perennials and um, that wild wildness that a lot of people still would have difficulty with, especially in nicer subdivisions. But it doesn't have to always be perennials. It can be native plants are occur in all different plant forms. So in this photograph, in the very back, we see these tall trees. This is white pine. This may be a pine or it may be an oak from native tree in the background, high up. In front of those are smaller native shrubs or tea trees with dogwood and um, redbud. In front of those, this, these could be boxwood, which are not native, but they also could be made of holly. In front of those, we have azaleas, which there are native azaleas. Some might even orange, which would go well. <laughs> <laughs> um, along with that, there are smaller plants that could be really statuesque perennials, and then along the front, ground covers that will eventually start covering up all that mulch there. So here you have a much more formal landscape that still is using all native plants that are providing all of those ecological benefits. So how do you get started? So now we're gonna we're gonna do more how do we how do we do this now? So first thing is understanding your site if you've got a lot of water, water standing, does anyone have moss in their yards? Okay, you've got moss in your yards. The moss is telling you something. The moss is telling you you've got shady, a shady site, you've got a moist site. So you're not gonna try and grow sun-loving plants in those areas. There's no way really to eradicate moss in fact, we had a speaker's bureau talk a few years ago where a beautiful talk about all the different mosses and um, on my property, I have mosses up near where I know the drain comes off of our roof, so I knew it was really moist there. So I planted a lot of ferns there. But further down the hill, I was walking last summer and I started seeing moss on the ground and I'm going, oh my gosh, the water from the lawn, from the yard, is slowly making its way down to the bottom of the slope and the spring we planted, I don't know, three dozen, four dozen ferns down there because the mosses are indicating that it's a moist enough and shady enough site for those ferns to thrive. So, those of you who have moss, if you came here to learn how to get rid of it, this is not the answer. <laughs> um, the, the goal, sort of the slogan is find the right place, the right plant for the right place. So if you've got moss, the right plant is going to be something that also likes damp and shade. 
the next um, issue is whether you have shade or sun. If you've got a shady yard with a lot of you name them in older neighborhoods with taller trees, again, you're not going to cut the trees down so you can get sun on that lawn so you can grow sunflowers. Um, and if you have sun, you're not going to try and grow ferns in the middle of the field because it's going to be too sunny for them. So understanding where the sun moves. And Chris, what's that, that website, that app that you have? Sun, sun Seeker. Sun Seeker. Those of you who want to fiddle around with um, knowing how to track the sunlight, you can what, stand in some location, hold the phone up, and it will, one, read your um, geographical location. And it, it basically just shows you the arc of the sun at different different times, so you can see the um, dead of winter, and then you see the spring um, uh, equinox, and then you just see the whole, it just shows you uh, um, where you stand over time, how much sun you can get. So how many hours of I was, sun? I was meeting six hours of sun per yeah. section, and I had to just kind of walk around my yard and figure out where are my six hours, where's my six hour spot, and that's where I put my little place down. Yeah, so if you go out in the middle of summer and you say, oh, this is, I need eight hours of sun, this is sunny, but by, in, in by fall, you're only got three hours of sun there because it's gone low in the sky and it's behind trees that are now shading it. So understanding that the sun seeker is the app, right? Okay. Now I know very few people are gonna do a soil test, even though we all say that you should do soil tests. So Marsh has been working with Master Gardeners for several years and they have to do the soil test in her classes. And she's finding, correct me if I'm incorrect here, that the people that live in undisturbed sites, like Chris and I live in, in neighborhoods that have never been a neighborhood. It's always, mine's a farmer's field and yours is just the woods. That's our soil tends to be a little more acid. So I'm about a pH of six, neutral is seven. Um, Chris, I don't think you've ever done that. <laughs> I'm guilty every time um, you're in class. But then those of you who live in subdivisions where all of the native soil has been stripped off and it's been like that for ages, the pH in that soil may be a little more alkaline, up in the 7, 7.5 range. So those of you who are hikers and go on the Smoky Mountains and see all the beautiful plants, the rhododendrons, the calmia, the um, azaleas, and come back here to your subdivision site and think, I've got to have those plants. They're not going to thrive because your soil is too alkaline. The Smoky Mountain soil is a totally different environment than ours, and the soils there are more acid. So understanding at, at least, I mean, you can do a soil test for all the different areas you might want to be planting, but in general, undisturbed sites like mine and Chris's, it's going to be a little more acid. I'm not sure even still, if that, I would be planting rhododendrons in our site. Um, and if you're in a sub new subdivision that everything's been cleared, it's going to be a little more alkaline. Um, the other thing to understand is what's there already. So some of you have existing large trees. Those are going to stay there. Um, and those are also going to impact your sun and your shade and the quality of the organic matter underneath those as well. So, preparing your site. Let's get into some nitty gritty here. Who knows what glyphosate is? What? Non master gardeners, please. <laughs> Kills everything. Kills it. Kills everything. It kills everything. It's Roundup. Glyphosate is the generic, is the chemical name for the brand name um, Roundup. But Roundup, or um, 
Yes, Roundup, which is owned by Bayer now, has lost their patent on that license. It's in all kinds of manufacturers and manufacturers like to say. And often you can find a little bit higher percentage of life say if you go somewhere else. Like I buy mine in gallon or half gallon containers from Tractor Supply. Where do you get yours? Amazon. Amazon. Um, so if you go to some of the stores that cater to more to farmers, like the Farmers Co-op perhaps, or Tractor Supply, you'll be able to find a higher percentage of life say for approximately the same price that you would find Roundup at um, the big box stores. And so this is how Chris and I remember we've got thousands of square feet we're dealing with. Did you have a question? Yes, I understood that that was really unhealthy for you and that it's taken off the market. I think Bayer took it off the market. Bayer took Roundup off the market. It, it, yeah, it took Roundup off the market because they were being hit with so many lawsuits. Glyphosate has not been taken off the market. Now it is harmful if you, one, go out and spray it with no protective clothing. So Marsha goes the step furthest of anyone I've seen. She uses bonafide respirator to protect her lungs. She wears goggles to protect her eyes. She wears gloves and a full hazmat suit with a hood on. <laughs> and the studies that have shown that um, Roundup is harmful to your health never really evaluated the protective clothing that the applicators have been using and never evaluated the frequency with which, with which they were using it. We've seen many university studies that have studied its impact on the soil, and that's negligible. The bacteria in the soil will easily take care of that actually, actually within, I think within 24 hours, it's gone. Um, so it's just how do you protect yourself? So I would still say, you know, if you're young and you're pregnant, maybe you want to have somebody else do this for you. But we use it because if you're trying to clear a site, the only way you can get rid of a lot of those plants is to spray it with Roundup. And I forgot, they're in my freezer. Um, how many people have Bermuda grass in their yards. Okay, question again? Yes, I understand if you put down plastic that would kill it, maybe you take away the cloud. Safer. Certain things will kill most things. Plastic will work if you put it down, seal the edges, water the site first, and leave it there during the hottest part of the summer, like July and August. So for at least a month, typically works better if it's six weeks. That's no guarantee that it's going to kill Bermuda grass. <laughs> the other thing about that is black plastic and it takes forever to, to decompose and that's something that... I'm sorry, wait, 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 I can't quite hear you. It takes forever, millions of years for plastic to decompose. Oh, yeah. So try not to use the plastic. It's definitely true. So when you're doing the plastic, it, it's called solarizing the soil. You're laying plastic down. The idea is you're creating like a greenhouse effect, effect that is getting um, the soil hot underneath and will kill, the, will kill the plants that are underneath that. You have to remove the plastic. You're not planting through it. So that's the other disadvantage. Now you've got all this plastic with which you have to dispose of. Um, it only heats up the soil a few inches deep. And the roots of some of those plants think dandelion where the roots can go down really deep. And you may pull a dandelion out and think you, you know, pulled it out. 
when you hear it snap and you take it out and there's only this much root that came out with it, that's because the rest of it is still in the ground and it will start growing again and it will often split into many dandelion plants coming off of that root. Um, where are they going here with this? So with Bermuda grass, the roots, um, Bermuda grass spreads by two ways. One has these really deep roots that are called rhizomes. Think, could be Charlie, think potato. Potato is a tubers of rhizome underground. The roots of some of the Bermuda grass can go down deep like those prairie plants. It can go down several feet. That means when you are just killing the top part of that plant, those rhizomes are still alive. And if they are there long enough, they will start popping back up. And the last thing you want to do is start a garden and have the Bermuda grass coming back up through. And, and part of the idea of this is that you're, if, if you're using chemicals on a lawn right now, you're using them multiple times throughout the year. Maybe you don't use any, but if, if people have lawn services, you're putting lots of chemicals down. If you convert to something else, we're talking about using one chemical one time and never having to use it again and not using other chemicals. So it ends up being kind of a trade-off. And by no means do you have to, you don't have to use glyphosate to, to do this kind of a, a project. It's not missed, it's not required. Um, but it, it makes the conversion process a whole lot easier and then it eliminates you having to use chemicals later or just hours and hours of weeding. So, um, and it's, it is, uh, quite controversial, there, there are, uh, but more and more, every, every prairie person, a prairie install person, or a landscape designer who I know who, who does this, mm -hmm. these conversions, they all use this method of just using it one time, getting rid of it, and never going back to having to use it again. Um, so, when Chris and I did the our properties, we spray it with Roundup, and now is the perfect time of year to do that because all of those roots are taking the energy from the leaves and channeling it down into the roots to provide um, nutrients for that plant to survive the winter. If you spray and kill that now, the plants have this chemical on their leaves and now the chemical the glyphosate is being drawn down into the roots of that plant, there's no hope that they're going to come back. Some plants are quite tenacious and often require two applications. So if you spray the glyphosate in now, come back in about four weeks and see if you've got any sprouts coming up of new of new console weeds. Then do a light spray again, but just target those areas where you see something. You don't have to do, you know, the whole 10,000 square feet. <laughs> so then, after all of that is, um, is bare, the next step is to cover that soil. And you can either use cardboard, Open these up, and if you're using cardboard, one, you have to remove the tape, take the staples out, remove the tape, all the tape everywhere, take the staples out if there's staples, open the thing up, lay it down, and wherever there's a gap, put something else underneath that so that light can't get through. It becomes a little tedious if you've got a large area. So Cassie and I were using bicycle boxes and other people have used appliance boxes. Those have larger pieces of plywood or kind of, um, of cardboard, but often you still get a lot of this stuff and you have to take that off because this is going to stay it down because it's plastic. And you don't want all the little bits and pieces of plastic left as the cardboard decomposes. 
So Chris and I have found, I think this was $15, 140 lineal feet, three feet wide, very, very heavy craft paper. Like heavy, like a grocery bag heavy. And for $15 for that amount of paper, what we find is that rolling this out on your area, and sometimes, I mean, if you've got a small area, which you're going to be starting small perhaps, um, put one row this way and one row crossways, overlapping them a few inches, and then you're going to cover all of that with wood chips. So wood chips are the recommended way to mulch now, as opposed to getting the mulch from the mulch guys, because they take all of this, all of this green waste from the city and compost it, which means a lot of the, um, a lot of these elements are composted out. But if you put all of these things in, the twigs, the pieces of wood, if you lay that down on your ground, it's more like the way woodlands develop. The tree falls, the bark falls off in one chunk, the wood eventually decomposes. This is a more natural way to mulch. And, I mean, if you need a lot, you can, probably, you'll probably get more than you need, but for $50 or even less, it's a donation offer. You can go to um, chipdrop.com and tell them, fill the website out, tell them what you want. Like I always say, I don't want any poison ivy. <laughs> Some people say, I don't want any walnut. So when an arborist goes and cuts down a tree in a neighborhood, they run that through the grinder and they will bring this to you and dump it on your driveway for a lot less than it would cost them to take it to the green waste facility to have them compost it so that you can buy it from already made. Yeah. So I've done that with chip shop and it doesn't look like that, of course, it's for a year or so. But I heard, read, that you need to get triple shredded wood chips, mm -hmm. which of course are going to cost you a lot more money because that's triple shredded. So you would do that and, put, and just get regular wood chips and put them yep. like this. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. So when you heard, did you hear that from what kind of website? Jim Putnam, Raleigh, North Carolina. He does a by several times a week. He was a nurseryman. Because they are selling you triple ground wood chips. Yeah, so if you are look, if you're doing research, our absolute recommendation is that you verify things not with retailers and not with blogs where people are answering this, that, and the other question. That you always go to an EDU site and that would mean a university, or um, an extension site, which is also based on the university. So UT is an extension, and they publish publications that have to all be mm, vetted by uh, other colleagues. So yeah, so to get information from some place that's selling you something is You've got to realize that they probably have an ulterior motive for recommending that. But no, no woods is chopping up their their wood chips, triple triples, whatever, triple grind, so that the plants growing underneath it can grow. I'm familiar with the YouTube site. I think he's great. Um, got a lot of good information, but might have misunderstood I think what he was advocating. He's not an academic, but he's done a whole lot in the industry. And he, 
then basically he's in 7B, but it's kind of similar sort of uh, horticultural area. Uh, but what he was advocating was arborist wood chips, uh, which is from the grinding up of trees and branches after they cut something down. And putting that down as a soil conditioner or on pathways or something and sort of letting it compost. And what he was advocating as far as the triple shedded hardwood bark mulch was just purely for decorative purposes on the top. Okay? Okay. And so it, it, it's, it's, yeah. uh, he's not selling anything either except he gets revenue from YouTube because he's a content creator, but, but it's, it's a good source. But I think that the, the and I've gotten to run the rancers over here on Bubble Road with my pickup, and you can take all you want of the barber's wood chips for free if you have the means to get Right, it. good. So I'm glad you brought that up because we have a slide coming up. Um, uh, well, first of all, let's finish this and we'll make sure we get on that. So, after you've killed everything with Roundup and it's all dead, then you want to water that really well. Then you want to lay down the cardboard or the paper. Then if you've got a large tree that you're putting in, you can put that in you know, before, you, before you do all of that. Um, or you plant that next year. What we're recommending is buy bare root trees, little things rather than a $200 tree from the site, the nurseries, and then paying someone another $200 to plant the tree. Um, so you're gonna layer all that paper and cardboard with wood chips and then you're going to let that sit all winter. You're not going to do any planting. You're just going to let the ground relax. And during the winter, you're going to start thinking. You're going to be start doing your research. So let's go, let's do the next slide. Oh yeah, we do, of the, the mulch site. Okay, um, we'll get there. <laughs> so the first thing I think it's important to see native plants that are not pictures in, on, on, the, on the web and not for sale when all the flowers are on them. The best time to go and look at them is when they're in the ground somewhere and you can see the whole plant and how it's performing. So these are three places here in town that have exclusive native plant collections. Um, Knoxville Botanical Gardens has uh, two areas in that. One is a native perennial area, and then near there is another area with, I don't know, two dozen or more native trees. Because remember, everything is not just perennial flowers, there are also trees that we could be considering in our lawn conversion. So the uh, Knoxville Botanical Garden over on the east side of town. And those are both sunny sites. If you want to um, see a shady site in, in Powell, there's um, the Collier Preserve and several of us have been working on planting the Collier Preserve with native plants, shade-loving plants. So it's a good place to go and see what those things um, look like in a shady environment. And then another sunny environment is um, Three Rivers Market. It's on Central and Baxter in Knoxville. It's a um, community food co-op. And the parking lot and the street side on two sides of the market are all landscaped professionally by native plant, um, landscape architect and plant designer. So their collection is, that's all native plants there also, and of course it's all sunny. This month, is definitely not a good time to go anywhere and look at plants because 
July and August is kind of that in between season. You know, everything looks good in June. July and August is kind of, you know. Oh, it's my glorious time. Yeah, right. it's all brown. If you like yellow, come to my yard in July. It's yeah. And then in October, September, and especially in October, is when everything starts growing beautifully colorful again. You've got yellows and of the Amazonia, you've got all the purples of various asters, and you've got the yellows of the golden rod. So there are a lot more opportunities to go to this, these places, both of these places, in late September and all of October to see what those look like. You want to see how they grow, what they look like, because a lot of the books you're going to read are from the northern states. And definitely down here, even though we can plant some of those down here, they're going to look different. Okay, next slide. So, you're then, you're looking at all of these sites, and then go back, I would say, go back in the spring and see what all those plants look like. Now you're going to start doing your homework over the winter. And... We've got a handout that lists um, resources for you. A lot of, even if you're not going to start things from seed, a really good resource is Prairie Moon Nursery. And Kurt, can you pull up their website? I'm going to walk you guys through what that. So Chris is typing in the word echinacea in the website in the search bar. And we get this page with all of these different different echinacea. So not the same plant. These are all different species. So we're going to click on this one. Where do you want to go? We want to start at the very top yeah. and click on the photograph of the plant. No, oh, yeah, the one right here. The big one, yeah. Okay. So you can scroll through and see that plant in native environment, what it might look like in a pot, how deep to plant it. Some things need to be below the soil quite a bit. Um, what the seeds look like, a close-up of what the flower looks like often with an insect on it or a bird, and other plants that grow alongside that. And that's a whole field of them, so what it would look like out in, in nature. Okay, let's go back to the um, script on the side. So what you're going to find is one, if you want to buy a pack of the seed, three bucks. Scroll down. There's a description, a description of the plant. There's a region, a range map that shows where that plant is native to. You can see here in Tennessee that that plant um, it, it occurs in Tennessee. You're also going to see a couple of other things that are important for you. One is, what kind of sun does it need? Full or partial sun? Your, what kind of moisture? Some things need really, really dry soil. And how high does thing gets? So if it's four feet, that's pretty high. Maybe you don't want that in your front yard. Um, and then when it blooms, what color it is? and what zone it's, um, is most comfortable in. So if you're doing research on a certain plant because you like the look of that plant, this is a good place to get a lot of that information, even if you're not going to be starting it from seed. All right, so let's go close that out now and go back to, so that's on your handout, Prairie Moon. The other good Research site is um, North Carolina Extension Gardener Plant Toolbox. So and I, I forgot to put this on your resource list. You know, and that's not right. on your resource list. So um, let's go back to the top at the top where you can see what the what website is. CES ncsu.edu it's plants plants dot ces dot 
NCSU, North Carolina State University, .edu. The beauty of this is even if you don't know the botanical name, like Echinacea, you can type in a common name right here in the search bar. So type in um, uh, red bud. Right well, there. I'm going to type it in this one. That's where I usually type it. Sit down. Oh, you go there? I always go here. So well, you to type in? So you can, you can get to it different ways, but you type in red bud. And you can even put the scientific name in, which is Circus, which most of you probably aren't going to know yet. Or you can put the common name in. And you can get all these different Circus and all these different cultivars of that. Anything with a parenthesis is a cultivar. So with this site, unlike Per and Moon, which just deals with perennials, this site deals with trees and shrubs, perennials, things that are native and things that aren't native, and that text will describe where it's native to and a lot, a lot of the cultural information. So that's another place to go for um, more information. Okay, let's get off these and the last big thing we want to talk about is how many plants do I need? The picture on the left shows where you're going to use that triple grind because you're going to see a big wad of mulch. This is the normal way for Americans to garden. You lay down four plants with three feet spacing in between because they maybe we'll eventually get that big. And then you fill everything else with mulch, which you then have to replace every other year, or maybe every year. So with using native plants, I mean, it's ecological alternative, you use a lot of plants, one foot apart. You don't know what one foot is. It's not that. That's three feet. <laughs> one foot is this far apart. One foot is, my hand is eight inches. If you don't want to, I mean, you can eyeball it. Eight inches and then four inches. That's a foot. So we're putting our plants, which can get to be two or three feet wide, one foot apart, which means when they start growing, the ground is all covered with greenery. There's very little opportunity for weeds to grow. And that's our main goal, by putting them that close. That's how they occur in nature. Everything is not spaced three or four feet apart because they get that big. Everything is like almost right on top of each other. Um, like that middle picture. The middle picture, Chris loves this because instead of mulch underneath trees, this is all sedge. Not the sedge that you're getting sledgehammer, sledgehammer for, but sedge as in, <laughs> as in this. And this is all, the botanical name of this is Carex. And these were started, these middle ones here were started by, with, from seed. Um, this spring, and they'll be planted in the fall. So you can see how many roots are already on those. So I've got 500 of these, and they cost me three dollars, three dollars for all of them. Does it die back each year? No, they're perennials. So you don't have to cut them. You don't have you have to cut them, you, but you, you don't. You can. I mean, you. Yeah, you can cut them. There are, and there are many sedges. There's a, a sedge called Carex woody eye that um, does great as a cut, even as a lawn. You, you can cut it kind of on a regular basis. I tend to just plant the sedge. I let it grow. I let it whatever it's going to do in the winter, and I don't ever cut it back. Yeah. I have some sections where I do, but not much. So but you if you're going to yeah, so if you're going to do a lawn of this, and I see you're taking notes, so you're going to do a lawn of this for you to buy. Um, a flat like this, you can only get it 
from a couple of places. You can't go to the local nursery and get a flat of 50 of these things because they don't sell them this way. This is how wholesale places sell their plants. And let's go forward. So let's stay here. So I told you I 400 of these, there's 50 in here, I've got eight of those. Um, and that cost me $3. I bought one, not much bigger, from Tennessee Naturescapes at um, a plant sale, and $8 for that. So you're not gonna go locally and buy $8 plants to replant your entire lawn. These are meant to be individuals. Do you need deep root trays? That's um, a deeper root root than those. The trays come in, there are some that, so these are, there are some that are even deeper, but most of them are the, this four is the five inches. The so this is the deepest one, five, it, it's about four, four, four inches deep. The, um, you can get trays that are only 72 yeah. slots, right. and they are shallower, but you have to get the plants planted that much quickly, more quickly. I mean, you can't stay in there mm -hmm. you know, six months. So you can start things from, I mean, if you're comfortable starting vegetable seeds, you may be able to do this. Um, you don't need lights, it's all done outside. So there's a difference in pricing of going to a local place. So let's um, show more local, this is um, Tennessee Naturescapes, it's in, um, up there. Clinton, on um, in Vaughn Orr. In, in Vaughn Orr, south of here, in his Overhill Garden, is quite, quite famous and huge native plant nursery. Again, the prices are up there, $8 for a four inch pot. Locally, you can get trees and shrubs and some perennials from the Native Plant Rescue Squad at the um, Arboretum. And they go to sites that are being under construction and they are um, taking plants off before they're mowed down, down by the bulldozers. Chris? Yes. We can also go to native um, plant sales. Um, the two good ones are at the Botanical Garden again in the spring. And they also have them in the fall. But remember, you're not planting anything this fall. And, um, and the Arboretum, um, UT Arboretum on Oak, going up to Oak Ridge on 162, going into Oak Ridge, is um, also another place that most of those nurseries that I just showed you have native plants that are for sale there. Again, they're not going to be three dollars for four hundred of them. All right. Are you saying that you those carex seeds that you grew from seed? I grew those from seed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, some carex grow easier from seed than others, but for three dollars is worth giving it a shot. Um, you can also get native plants of some of the native um, greenhouses, families, Ellenberg and Meadowview, but you gotta know what you're looking for. They're, that's not all they sell, but it's not normally what well. they focus on. Okay. And then if you want to get native plants in plots like this, or maybe six or so of them, go to this website, Prairie Nursery, and it's on your thing, and you can get you can get kits where they put plants together in, I don't know, what, eight or ten plants in a flat. Can you pull that up? No, it's, I mean, it wasn't made for some reason. So. And so you can get more plants, not at wholesale prices. 
Now this is this is a great site because they will uh, give you custom plant kits over here, uh, up to 32 plants. You can and you can do multiple of those if you wanted to do that. Yeah, see this be, picture. So that's 32 plants. That's I don't know, down to these are 32. Um, so that's a, but it's not gonna do your whole lawn. Another, another source is IZL, I-Z-L-E, I-Z-E-L. <laughs> and they source from the wholesale growers and mark it up appropriately and sell that to you. So from a wholesale grower, um, this might be something like $75 and from ISIL it might be $200. So you're paying more but it's still the cheapest thing after starting from seed. Where's your favorite place to buy grass sedge seed? Prairie Moon. Okay. Prairie Moon is where all of the seed came from. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we have a section of the front yard that's got Bermuda grass and weeds and mostly African violets. And I want to. Af no, regular violets. Wild violets. Wild, wild, wild. Yeah. yeah. Wild African violets. I want to do the simplest thing possible. The, uh, cheapest thing possible, and I'm thinking of putting down soil, buying some wild African violet seeds, and making it African violet. Well, they're not African violets, they're native violets. Yeah, yeah, wild, wild, wild violets. So where can um, I get wild African violet seeds? <laughs> you can get wild no, violet seeds wild, lots of places. From Prairie Moon you can get you seeds, can get them there too. but it's not easy starting a whole batch of seeds outside. They, they have a lot of time before they're going to germinate in their little tiny things. And, um, so you may want to do more research on some alternatives. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, let's, let's get all the way through these things. Um, so here's some examples of how your front yard could evolve. These are Cassie's, and I'm going to talk for you just because it's faster. Um, <laughs> so, so what is this, about eight feet, six, six feet or eight feet wide? And this, is, this was several years ago, but this is a nice subdivision. And you notice everyone else doesn't have anything in their front yards, maybe one tree. So Cassie has this amazing yellow wood tree, a native tree in the corner. Um, that was there when she moved in. And then this is all new garden space. So she just bought these flocks, creeping flocks, and popped those in there. That's the next slide, Chris. And this is what that looks like, what, five or six years later. All of those flocks have grown together. That's a ground cover. So she gets all that color in the spring, and then maybe this is what you want for your front lawn. Um, and you notice also that here she's got that tree, but she's also got another native tree that she planted that's smaller, that's a double income. And over on this side, another smaller shrub. Those are right against the curb in that subdivision. You're gonna get less flack from a, a subdivision that looks like that than one that looks like Chris's. <laughs> Chris does not face a subdivision street. Yeah. How much water does that take? This. So native plants exist in the wild with no additional water. So our whole goal here is no water, no fertilizer, no soil additives. You don't go adding nitrogen in the spring. You don't put holytone on things. It just, you pick the right plant and it will grow for you. First year, of course, you have to water it because the roots are only that deep. You want them to start getting down in the soil. But once it gets going, those of you with sprinkler systems, you can just turn them off. All right. 
Kathy. And then Kathy now is expanding her garden and she cleared all this and she's putting down cardboard. Is this and behind that section or in a different part? No, so the street, so the street's the over here flat. now. We're looking from the opposite okay. direction from the lawn side. The driveway is here. Okay. The street's out there. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's do the next slide. So this is Chris's and so <laughs> We built this house and we built it in woods and I didn't have to do some of the so stuff. So Chris, we're yeah, you're way over. We're like way over, so just keep it short. Okay. I didn't I, <laughs> so uh, I didn't have to do all of the steps, but basically I had a load of wood chips brought in, I put two layers of paper down, and this first section I did was about twenty six hundred. This is a side view and then this is looking from that from where the dog is looking down into the yard. And so that was where I planted them. And you can't really see them very well, um, but I have basically two warm season grasses. I have little blue stem, and I have side oats grama, and then I have two wildflowers, two perennials. I have um, um, echinacea, and I have rebecca. And the rebecca is a uh, forgida. It's not that herda that's a biennial that comes so these, those plants are one foot apart. I put them all in one foot one apart. One foot apart. And all right, next one. So this is the first year. That's nine months later. And these are the exact same views. So this is first year. Dog was here. Way. And the yeah. grasses. These are the grasses. They're growing slowly. That takes forever. The fulgita comes up really fast. And then okay. The next next slide year is that's last year. So it's starting to feel it even more. So this is probably a little bit too um, high and wild to put it in your front yard in a really fancy neighborhood. But okay, let's do the next the next one. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry yeah. All right. So yeah. So <laughs> we are way over. So this um, resource list is what you have on your sheet, and you wanted to add that one from North Carolina today. Um, we're so sorry. <laughs> I thought we could finish really fast. Marsh is there going. <laughs> um, so those of you who want to chat more, we'll stay here longer. Um, I've got all these examples of things. These are all started from seed or from cuttings um, or from donations from seeds from people. This came from Marsha. And so I can talk about more about all these if you want, but if you need to hit the road. Um, and I highly recommend this book. Um, oh. Benjamin Vogt is um, uh, world renowned, really. He, he lives in Nebraska. But he's written this book to basically say it's possible for anyone to do this. And, and he, would, he would stand right here and say, you can do it as small as you want, as big as you want. Just start and do something. And I'm going to make it as simple um, a process. As, Everything and, and they it, covered is in here. He lays it out. He, you know, he gets into as much depth as, as you want. Um, plant selections and yeah. all sorts of things. And um, he's got a great website with lots of videos. Kathy, I have one thing. You know, starting small and going to different areas. You don't always have to buy new seed or new plant. You let them stay in the ground. You know, maybe up to three years. They're great and ready to buy, and you can move them around with a new bed. Right. Yeah, so I I bought this one plant from Overhill for $4, and it's a sedum. And so I don't know that those who, of you who have sedum, but you can just break up the tips of this and stick them in soil, and they will root. And that I have a, a flat here filled with, so I have about three of those at home. But that was four dollars for all of those just by taking some cuttings of them. Um, so there's lots of ways to make your dollar stretch. Um, all right, I'll take more questions. Those of you who need to hit the road, um,